OK, great. We're recording. Uh, so I'm really excited about today's talk. Uh, yesterday's talk on Intro to Azure Quantum uh, was really well received. We're super excited uh, to welcome Daiwei Zhu from INQ uh, to this uh, today's uh, virtual workshop. And uh, I'll turn it over to you now, Daiwei, and we'll do our best to uh, answer questions in the chat as you go. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking your time coming to this workshop. My name is Daiwei Zhu. I'm an application scientist at INQ. I'll be your showman today. Uh, first, uh, the most important takeaway of this talk, uh, please register for the raffle to win your Surface 2 headset. The deadline to submit the form is Friday noon uh, Pacific time. Please take a screenshot uh, and or scan the QR code. OK. Uh, <clears throat> Let's take a quick look at the outline. We will go through the physics of trapped ion quantum computation at the first for today's talk as a first section. Uh, and then we will move to tips for you to make the best out of it for this hackathon or in the future in general. I will try to focus on intuition and avoid math. But please definitely feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions, comments, or anything seems unclear. OK. Uh, Maria already talked about quantum algorithm yesterday, so I will be brief here. Uh, why quantum computing? Uh, there are different ways to interpret the power of quantum computation. A way I personally find helpful is this quantum computation, quantum computer can store information in superposition using entanglement. So using unitary operation, this superposition can all be processed in parallel. But now we also have a bad news. The bad news is whenever you do measurement, even though you can parallel be processing everything, whenever you do measurement, you always you only get one random result out of all those parallelly processed output in superposition. OK. <clears throat> so what can we do? Here comes another good news. That is quantum gates, single qubit gates, two qubit gates forming the universal gate set would enable us to create quantum theorems. And hopefully this kind of cleverly engineered interference, which we could also call quantum algorithm, would amplify the probability of measuring the desired results. So what does quantum computer actually looks like? OK, here we go. One of the almighty INQ quantum computer, uh, the dark one and the white LED actually help with the performance. That's why photos of quantum computer always look like this. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so what is inside the box? If you open the box and look into it, be careful about the scale. If you zoom really, 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 really close into it, you will see this, right? Like so many like factors magnified by so many factors. This is a chain of ion trapped inside vacuum. Here, what you see is a video that we took last year of 25 atoms floating in the space. They're glowing because we are illuminating them with a laser beam. And you see they lined up perfectly, allowing us to address our qubits with laser, much like how you'd address bits in an array. OK, so what do we do? with this ions when we actually run the quantum computation. Um, you can't really take video of that, but here is an animation. Let's see. OK, so in practice, our computation performed with ion. Basically, intuitively, you can think it as an extremely precisely orchestrated symphony made of blinking ions and lasers. As we go through the circuit, using lasers to apply gates, 
we, we use laser to apply gates to different ions. So intuitively, that's how running a circuit on ion trap quantum computer feels like. Okay, now let's dive into more detail. First, most important ingredient, you will need qubits. So at the heart of the box is a small chip that holds the ions. It is fabric, this one, I mean, uh, nowadays, uh, ion trap are mostly microfabricated surface trap. There are many different variations out there. Uh, this one particular is fabricated by Sandia National Lab. It can generate electric potential that trap the ion. Uh, the trapped ion, as you see showing in this figure, floats as we've seen in the previous slides. So all qubits lose information over time. When most of the information are lost, the computation is ruined. And that's why that's one of the biggest advantage that ion provide that ion grant us with, because ion is very much isolated with from the environment if we don't apply laser to it. OK, now we have the qubits, we have the ion. We also need to be able to distinguish the states of the ion or the qubit. Uh, for most ion, what people do is use a laser. We shine the laser. In this specific case, if we're using Eterbium 171 as our qubits, we would use a 370, 370 nanometer laser. We would shine the laser on the ion. And these two states here represent like marked by purple and the red. It are what we used as qubit one state and qubit zero state. When we have 370 nanometer laser on it, only this qubit one state would resonate with the laser. What does that mean? is it will keep transition, it will like keep jumping between this upper energy manifold and this one state and give up fluorescence. Okay, so we then we use extremely well engineered optics to collect the photons. Here you see in this picture is an array of fiber aligned together very carefully aimed at each qubit, at each ion. Uh, so they're sort of like in an array that basically mirrors the configuration of the ion chain before. So with this, we can we can collect the photon emitted by each ion with really, really high efficiency. And as a result, we generally have really, really good detection efficiency and detection fidelity with ion systems. Okay. And in terms of coherent qubit manipulation or qubit gates, we use high power 355 laser to implement our quantum gates. Again, this is specific case for Eterbium 171 ions. If we use other ions, likely we'll need another laser system of, la of different frequencies. But in general, they all share the similar mechanism. Our qubit is good because these two states normally don't couple with each other. So we have to use, what do we have to use is this so-called Raman interaction to drive the transition. It basically bridges the two states indirectly using this auxiliary state. Okay, so with this Raman transition, uh, as a result, we'll have what's we will have what's known as Rabi flood, that is basically coherent population transfer between these two states. And intuitively, how we run two qubit gates? Okay, there are actually many schemes for it, but the most popular one these days is what's known as the Mohn Sorensen gates. All these schemes use shared motion of ion to bridge the information. Intuitively, you can think this as using laser, for example, this one, to encode information of this qubit into the vibration or into the motion, as you see here. This vibration or this motion, right, 
is shared by the whole chain because the motion of all the ions are coupled together because ions are charged. So each of the ions can feel the motion and feel the repulsion from other ions. That's why they, that's that way they share the motion. So when you pass the information from this qubit onto the motion shared by the whole chain, such information can also be decoded or you could say extracted by this qubit if we use laser to interact with it. OK. Uh, and this is why we sometimes call this shared motion of the ions a shared quantum data bus. Uh, yeah, importantly, since the motion is shared by all the ions, by all the qubits, gates, quantum gates, can be applied natively on any pair of ions, giving us what's known as the RTOR connectivity. OK. There are different ways to independently control each ion with laser beams. A more traditional way is to split beam into many, uh, into many, one beam into many beams, and then use a so-called multi-channel AOM, multi-channel acoustic optic modulator, to control each of the beam separately. Another way is to use the acoustic optical deflector to steer two beams onto the desired target, as you've seen here. Okay. So to quickly summarize it, both single qubits and two qubit gates are driven by coherent lasers. You can think both as Rabi oscillation that rotate the qubit states on the block sphere. The difference being oscillation of a single qubit or in this case, two qubits together in a, in a correlated way. And like any Rabi oscillation, there's two degree of freedom. There's two degree of freedom we can control. One correspond to the angle of rotation of the block sphere controlled by the duration of the laser. Essentially the duration of the control electronics that, con that we use either by AOM or by the uh, acoustic optic deflector, as we see in the previous slide, to control the pulse, the duration of the pulse. The second is the axis of the rotation controlled by the phase of the laser. Uh, and in this case, as you can see, uh, this is uh, the oscillation of the laser pulse. And depending on where the ion sits at the pulse, it sits different phase, corresponds to the phase of the electronic signal or the laser. Okay. And use this, using this two degree of freedom, we can perform single qubit gates, single qubit rotation, or two qubit rotation along any axis on the xy plane for arbitrary angle. So that's how, and using this ingredients, we generally fix some parameter. So the two qubit gates, um, so we have this for two qubit gates, and we have uh, this interaction as you're seeing on the left for single qubit gates. Well, again, uh, intuitively, just take it as we can use the duration of the laser and the phase of the laser to control the rotation angle, either of single qubit rotation or two qubit rotation. Okay, now what's left for us to complete a universal gate set that, that we have to, that we will need for quantum computation is the rotation along the z-axis. This is actually a simple operation for ion trap quantum computer because the phase, which is uh, basically defines the z-axis, is actually um, defined with respect to the reference frame. And in our case, the reference frame is the phase of the control elect electronics. You can also think this as a clock we use to trap to track each qubit. So to rotate a qubit along z-axis, 
we just need to remember that the reference frame of the qubit is changed and adjust the orientation of other following operation accordingly. Put it in another way, to advance or delay the state of the ion, we just need to delay or advance the clock that track the qubits. We call this virtual RZ operation because we don't really do anything to the qubits physically other than bookkeeping of the phase. Okay, for example, um, what we see here is the relative phase is how the uh, x axis of the qubits are aligned and how the x axis of the ion or the clock is aligned. In both of these two cases, uh, the relative phase become like the x. So in both of these cases, the x axis of the electronics is advanced relative to the axis of the ion. That would correspond to a phase advance, but we can either advance the phase of the electronic signal or we can delay the phase of the qubits. They give the equivalent effect. And we do the simpler one, which is basically just change the electronic signal. Okay. Uh, with this, I will go to the compilation, but we went through a lot of the physics of ion trap. So I will take a pause here and see if people have questions. I don't see any questions in the in the chat, Tyler. Okay, okay, sounds good. So let's then talk quickly talk about the compilation. So what happens when you submit a circuit compiled either with Qiskit, represented either as a Qiskit circuit, as a circ circuit, as a chasm circuit, any kind of representation? What happens when you submit those to INQ server? Um, the circuit, whatever the representation, will first be translated into some standard gate set. In our case, we use Rx, Ry, Rz, and C0 as a standard gate set. This gate set is not directly converted into laser pulses, but we first apply optimization on circuits written with these four gates. And after the gates get optimized, we then convert the gates, convert convert the circuit now up now written with rx ry rz c naught and optimized into native gates representation which now is basically the native gates representation is what describing the laser phase and the laser duration and then we use this description of the laser to generate actual laser process control and then we apply those laser passes onto the qubits. Now that's when we get to this run on QPU, basically means those laser are applied on the ions. And then the by default, then the qubits will the result will go through post-processing and error mitigation. And then the result will be returned to users. Okay. Hi, Daiwei? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but we had a question in the chat. Sure. Uh, Rajesh is asking, what is the decoherence time for trapped ion? Uh, the decoherence time for trapped ion. <clears throat> uh, on literature, uh, you commonly, I, I can't really comment on uh, IonQ's um, coherence time uh, regarding each of our system. But in general, if you look into literature, uh, this days for experiment, Without too much hard work, you can easily get to uh, the level of five to ten seconds. Depending on, uh, also depending on uh, ion species, but that's generally the number. Uh, and if you go more extreme in very finely tune your environment, 
and shielding all the noise and keep really good track of your walk clock, walk clock, which is basically keep track of your face. You can easily go to, um, you can easily extend the coherence time to something like ours. Um, we're mostly here talking about the face coherence time. Okay. Uh, and another thing is we, this days we don't usually only looking at uh, coherence time, right? Because you have that much coherence time, you will use it to do qubit operations. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the number really has its own meaning, has its meaning, practical meaning in the practical sense, when you also consider the gates time. So I guess um, I would just say together that the gates time for specifically for two qubit gates, which is longer these days, is usually on the level of hundreds microsecond. So uh, without too much tuning, so putting those not two numbers together, it usually allows us to do something like um, tens, so tens of thousands of two qubit gates. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, are there any other questions? I think that's, oh, we have one more, yes. Is there a way we can see the compiled native gates after submitting a circuit that uses abstract gate sets? Uh, is there a question whether we can see the submitted, uh, whether, uh, is there a way to like basically check what is the actual native gates get executed on the QPU in the cloud, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure how you would do it using the platform setup for the hackathon, but uh, there is definitely, definitely some, uh, there is definitely some API that you can use to get that information, um, but probably that would, uh, we would only be able to provide, um, I mean, probably would need to look into that with some other folks from INQ, I guess. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, then let's just quickly summarize um, with uh, another fancy slide. Um, <laughs> so, Individual, so with ion trap quantum computing, we use individual ato atomic ion qubits in an ion trap for quantum computation. They are capable of delivering reliable, consistent, high fidelity performance. In particular, uh, the qubits are identical and naturally quantum, and they're perfectly isolated from environment influence, which grants us very long coherence time. Uh, they're also reconfigurable, meaning you're making one trap, you're making one software, you're making one hardware stack. All of them can be used with arbitrary number of ions trapped inside this trap. They also have all to all connectivities and long qubit lifetime. Uh, in di different from coherence time, this qubit lifetime really means how long we can keep the ions inside the trap. Uh, some maybe relevant thing back in old time, uh, qubit ions doesn't always stay in trap, but these days they have been super, super reliable. You know, they stay in your trap and will always be there almost. Yeah. With that, we finish the first section of our workshop, which is ion trap quantum computing basics. I hope you learned a lot of intuition about how ion trap quantum computer works and like me, think it's super cool. Um, so next, we will move to best practices that I hope with some suggestion that include suggestions, tips that I hope will help you in your um, later exciting hack in this hackathon. Okay, so, uh, I basically saw, I summarized five best practices. First is take advantage of the connectivity, R2R connectivity to be specific. Also, 
use native gates. Um, we'll talk more about it, uh, not really directly using native gates, but I'll explain later. And also try different qubit definition also, and remove overly precise gates and play with cloud-based simulator. So first item, take advantage of connectivity. As we mentioned before, uh, facilitated by this shared motional mode, which we use as quantum data bus, that the motion bus shared between all the qubits, all the ions in the chain, IonQ system is capable of providing all to all connectivity. Uh, unlike other technology, that means gates can be natively applied to all pair of qubits. How we take advantage of this in gates compilation? Basically, it means you don't need to use swap gates to connect the qubits. Um, to be specific, uh, as you can see in this figure, if you want to apply two qubit gates between this two pair of qubits, if you have limited connectivity, you have to use swap gates to slowly, gradually, sorry, to just uh, gradually moving, swapping qubits, this one to here, to here, to here, all the way to the neighbor of this qubit, and then apply the gates you, you and then apply the two qubit gates you want, and then uh, using swap gates to shift this qubit back depending on if that's necessary. But uh, ion trap system, you can just directly apply qubits, two qubit gates on any pair. And with this capability, it also means your swap gates, if it's not controlled swap, if it's just swap gates, any of such swap gates can be performed with just index swap. So we call that virtual swap gate. Okay. Then is stick close to native gates. Yeah, that's that's what I mean by use native gates. Stick close to native gates. Uh, what does this mean? Is IonQ systems natively support four different gates, um, resonating with what we mentioned before in the previous section about the physics of ion trap. Um, it's basically single qubit rotation of two different type, two different angles uh, on the block sphere along along any axis in the xy plane a virtual rz rotation and a moment sorensen gate which is a simultaneous rotation of two qubits along block sphere in this case for an angle of pi over 2 or pi over 4 depending on your definition but it's the maximum entangling one okay and also the RZ, which is a virtual operation. It has no fidelity loss, yeah? So these are the four native gates. When you write a circuit, as we mentioned, the first step is always to translate your circuit into uh, CNOT, RX, RY, RZ, right? And then it's optimized and get translated into our native gates, which are this four. So when you do that, so the optimization, okay, um, maybe I should, uh, yeah, the right way to say is uh, our native gate set is very close, close enough to uh, RX, RY, RZ, C naught, that conversion between these two don't really generate much overhead and is rather straightforward. But when you convert any different kind of gates, some arbitrary gates, into C naught, RX, RY, RZ, you likely will generate some overhead. And those overhead usually will not be optimized away by optimization procedure, any kind of optimization procedure perfectly. So if you do, if you use some particular um, convention to write your circuit, going through this translation, compilation, and optimization step 
you may end up having unnecessary overhead compared with in contrast to if originally your circuit is written with C naught RX, RY, RZ, or if they are written with these four native gates, right? So that's what we mean by stick close to native gates as much as possible for your circuit compilation. This reduces the overhead. Okay, so we covered the, four, the first two, and I will take another break here, I guess, uh, in case people have any questions. Hi, uh, could you be maybe a little more precise about how precise we should avoid being with our gates? Uh, uh, sorry, what's the question again? You had a bullet point saying to avoid using overly precise gates. Oh, oh that's yeah. later on. I'm, yeah, yeah, that's I'm later on. There. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's later on. Yeah. I don't see any other questions in the chat right now. Anyway. Okay, cool. Then let's go to the next thing, which is more, more or less interesting and subtle, which is try different qubit definition. Um, what does this mean is the orientation of the algorithm usually can be defined in an arbitrary sense. Um, to change your definition, you just need to change the sense of orientation, the sense of a relative orientation between the qubit and your algorithm. Okay, um, let's to make this last abstract, let's look at this. Um, this uh, brighter green arrow is your definition for your algorithm, um, and this darker arrow corresponds to the z-axis for the qubit. So you can say in your algorithm, your z-axis is aligned with the z-axis of the qubit. You can also say your z-axis of your algorithm is aligned in some other direction. All right. In this in this case, maybe x axis or y axis of your qubits. And in this one, let's just say it's a negative z axis. And so on and so on. Okay. Uh, let's be more with this intuition. Let's look at the specific case. Is for example, if you want to simulate a transverse field icing model. Yeah, and your, your uh, Hamiltonian in some convention can be written as this, uh, two qubit x, x gate, and a single qubit z as your Hamiltonian. However, it's because the definition of the blocked sphere is arbitrary, you can just say your qubit x axis is actually z axis and your z-axis is actually x-axis, and you align this way. Now, you basically have the same Hamiltonian. You basically run the same algorithm, again, because the definition of the block sphere, the orientation of the block sphere is more, it is arbitrary. However, our physical implementation of quantum gates are not homogeneous. Right? Put it the other way, for example, as we've seen before, how we do our X gate is different from how we do our Z gate. In this specific example, we mentioned before, in this case, single qubit Z gates are performed virtually. We do virtual Z gates. But if you use the Hamiltonian or definition written on the right side in this way, you will have your single qubit gates now actually become physical. You actually have to use laser to drive your ion to implement these gates. So because they're implemented differently, the actual result you get will be different, right? In general, it's quite hard to predict which one will lead to better performance. Um, typically, we say that due to the RZ gates, this type of single qubit gates, 
because they're virtual, we kind of, uh, we intuitively think this will give a better result because you basically have less number of gates. However, in practice, I'd really say um, it's highly depend and vary case by case. That's why the guideline here, the tips, the suggestion is try different qubits definition. Okay, let's look at another example, which may or may not be more concrete. Okay, uh, say we want to prepare a GHZ state, which uh, in this case, in the case of four qubits, it's basically all zero, in is basically a super equal superposition of all zero and all one. And just like when we prepare any other state, we want the states to be prepared in a way that it can stay coherent and stay pristine for a long time. But again, because your definition of qubit can be defined in an arbitrary way, on the, you can actually prepare 0, 1, 0, 1 plus 1, 0, 1, 0, an equal superposition of 0, 1, 0, 1 and 1, 0, 1, 0. And you just say, I defined my qubit differently. My second and fourth qubit, the zero is defined in the negative z direction. So here you see one in terms of the ion definition, but you actually read this as zero. So you say this state I prepared is my according to my def, according to your definition is zero 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 plus one one one. But on the right hand side, okay, you just go with standard definition. You say your the z definition of your qubits is just aligned with your ion z and you have zero 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 plus one 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 in terms of how you uh in terms of how it looks like on ions right but this one on the left is known to have way less phase noise because for ion when your state qubit state is in zero and one they're affected by generically any kind of noise in an exact opposite way. To be precise, I should say not all noise, but most, but a lot of noise that contribute most to infidelity for those one, the zero and Y accumulate arrow in an opposite way. This way, if, you were if, you if your definition is given as what's seen like this, zero, one, zero, one. The phase noise accumulated will be can while canceling each other. The, no the, fa the noise accumulated by zero and by one while canceling each other. Thus, this definition, if you prepare a GHD state according to this definition, will stay coherent for much longer time. Again, in a more complicated example, usually, uh, it's hard to tell. So again, uh, the recommendation is if you think this necessary, I will please try different qubit definition and one of them may give you better performance. Hey, excuse me, Daiwei, got a question in the chat. Yeah. Is the changing orientation the same as changing the basis of measurement? You have to do both. You know, uh, when you change the definition of your qubit, you also have to change your measurement, right? Uh, so, for example, when you say your z axis is along z, is along the is along the ion z, you measure along positive z, right? And your z rotation is along positive z. But however, when you change your definition of your z, say you you define the algorithmic definition of your qubit to be along the negative direction of the ion Z. Then your Z rotation now become negative Z rotation, right? Your RZ become negative RZ compared with before. However, when you read it out, you also say like you also flip your positive Z to your negative Z. So you usually have to do both. Uh, you have to change the definition of your gate operation, and you also have to swap the readout result. 
Uh, one more question. Okay. Does the Z, do, sorry, does the Z reference frame technique only follow for even digit state vectors? Uh, for even digits, they, uh, in this particular example, if you have even digits, yeah, they perform the best, right? Because they cancel exactly in this configuration, in this definition, uh, compare with this, which uh, I think the noise, but well, not I think, uh, it is the noise accumulate, uh, noise amplifies in the most extreme way, right? So, but if you don't have, um, if you don't have even number of qubits, say you want to prepare a five qubits GHZ state, right? Uh, then having two of them defined differently than the other three qubits still give you a lot of cancellation in terms of noise compared with if you define all five qubits along the same direction. You define the Z axis of that five qubits along the same direction. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, now uh, easier one is remove overly precise gates. Uh, simple thing, uh, just rotation precision for Rx and Ry uh, in our current generation system is about 10 to the minus three pi. There is no benefit to supplying gates with angle much lesser, much smaller than this. Uh, you will basically just run a gate that doesn't do anything. Um, it's essentially zero, but you accumulate the noise uh, coming uh, caused by this gate for nothing. So if you realize, so if you, when you look at your circuit, if you realize some rotation angle are smaller than 10 to the minus three pi, uh, we would recommend you just delete those gates. And the one last thing uh, is try to play with the cloud-based simulator. The results you received from the QPU all went through a really, really long journey, right? You have the translation, optimization, compilation, going through the quantum realm. I don't know what this reference is for, right? You use the cloud. Uh, and then after all this, the result is returned to you. And I hate to say this, but it's very easy that some of this uh, some of this procedure uh, where you will have you could have something that doesn't really is that isn't really what you expect. Um, so we usually recommend as a best practice is when you have when you try to run some circuit, use a cloud-based simulator to make sure they match your expectation. Uh, the easiest way to do this is really just uh, depending on what circuit SDK you are using, try to run some local simulator and then uh, compare the local simulation result with the result that you would run on a QPU by setting that to, sorry, make sure your local simulator result agrees with the job you submitted to QPU, but, uh, but specified the target on the cloud end as simulator. So cloud end simulator. Make sure cloud end simulator result matches your local simulator result. Yeah, okay, jeez. Um, and finally, you should run simulation and avoiding you should run simulation to try some kind of noise locally to gauge what is the performance that you expect, uh, whether they would be influenced by, why would, wh whether they would be impacted by noise in any significant way. Uh, and you should also avoid running long circuits. Uh, with the current generation, uh, the, uh, the ARIA, with the ARIA system that you all will be running your circuits on, a guideline in general is if is generally circuits with longer than with more than 100 two qubit gates, you should expect to see uh, about 50 or 40 percent fidelity. So it's well. So the signal you observed will be dampened by at least 
if not more than 60%. Um, you could design, you could use all the suggestions, all the tips we covered in the previous slide to try to optimize it, but always for your first attempt, we would recommend try something with no more than 100 qubit gates. So to summarize, take advantage of the RTR connectivity, use something really similar to the native gates, try different qubit definition, remove overly precise gates, and play with the cloud-based simulator. Make sure your result match your expectation. Finally, uh, here's a page that is, he, here are some plots prepared by my colleague, uh, Joshua Goings, uh, which could be really useful for you to expect uh, what is the cost of per submission for your circuit, what will be the runtime for your circuit per submission, and what kind of fidelity you should expect according to the number of one qubit and two qubits in your circuit. And I highly recommend using this as a guideline and estimate the cost in terms of the not just the money, the runtime and the fidelity cost before you submit. And with that, I'd like to conclude uh, my presentation. Thanks for your attention and feel free to bring up if you have any question. Thanks, Taiwo. I don't see any questions currently in the chat, but uh, people feel free to unmute and ask questions directly. You must have explained everything so perfectly. <laughs> no, no room for questions. <laughs> exactly. What is your favorite algorithm to run? That's a question that came up. What is my favorite algorithm? Um, it's a very good question. <laughs> this is the point you're supposed to say. Oh man, it's supposed to be an easy question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really like what this day is known as uh, interactive, like interactive algorithms. Um, the easiest, uh, the most popular form format of it probably is those error correction algorithm um, that you can see how your interaction with the um, with the quantum computer can actually improve the performance right by cleverly running some protocols, and it has also been quite uh, been quite deeply studied that if you use this type of interaction, you can use it, you can verify uh, computations by just asking question, uh, sorry, just by, uh, let me see, how did I say this? Just by keep running some algorithm and test subsection of those algorithm in a classically possible way, you would be able to verify some computation or some calculation you performed, someone performed on quantum computer, which is out of your computation capability. If you ask enough question, even you cannot reproduce those computation, you can still figure out whether you should trust, trust the answer or not, which, you know, this kind of interaction-based verification has been one of my favorite recently yeah that's great thanks uh there is one other question uh is there any additional credits for research scholars um i will answer that first and then you can add to it that way yeah. uh, we actually do have a by application credits program for azure quantum where you can get granted access to credits for uh, qualifying research work uh, on the INQ system. So I'll be happy to put that link in the in the chat here. Yeah, we also run, um, in general, we run a research program with partners. So yeah, we will review the proposal. And if they are granted, usually you will get uh, quite some um, credit 
to run your proposal and you know thanks uh one other question uh do you use mid-circuit measurement on your system ah good question um currently our system doesn't really support mid-circuit measurement so um but uh the INQ system does is indeed in an interesting regime in terms of fidelity and number of qubits. So what I mean by that is don't let the missing of the mid circuit measurement stop you from exploration. Uh, try to use qubits as ancilla and try to use qubits for post processing to mimic um, mid circuit measurement. Um, people have been getting good result by doing that. And yeah, that's my recommendation. Great, thank you. Any further questions? It's a great talk, by the way, that way. Thanks, man. Okay, I see a uh, hand up. It's uh, Chase. Yeah, please go ahead and ask your question. Cool. Um, thanks. Is that Matt? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Matt. Um, my question is the, the redefining the basis states that you mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. Is there any way to do that in, in the IonQ software, or is that something we just need to mentally keep track of? with our algorithms? Uh, I don't think there's easier way. I don't think there's easy way to just use some. I, I don't think there's a built in way for SDK to directly convert your circuit for that. Um, the usual, usual way I do is I usually have limited. I usually write my circuit using a limited using a gate set of limited elements, right? For example, Rx, Ry, Rz, and Xx gate. I would just give a lookbook, lookup book, lookup table for each of the gates, right? For example, what is X, what is Rx changed into? What is Ry changed into? What is Rz changed into? And just run and just convert every gate in my circuit using the lookup table. Um, okay, I think um, maybe you're, I, I wasn't asking about the changing like the bit flip to the RX or the R or the, the RY gates or the RZ gates. I, mm -hmm. I was talking about like uh, with the circuit optimization when, when you want to minimize noise by maximizing your virtual gates. Um, do you have to keep track of that? And how does that work when I'm when I'm using like a, a Malmer Sorensen and I'm, I'm entangling qubits? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you uh, elaborate more? Um, yeah, it, it was, I guess, maybe, maybe I, I don't know. It's, it was that this, this, this sort of slide here. Um, the, the if I'm if I'm entangling two qubits and I want to do like redefine my bases for minimizing noise, uh, I'm not sure how I'd handle it with with multiple qubit gates. I see, I see. Um, it depends what you use, what gate set you use. Um, you can just directly use XX gate and ZZ gate. Uh, they will be compiled <laughs> in a convenient way, uh, which because it actually goes through the compilation, so you probably lose control over it. Uh, it may in the end be converted, get converted into the same thing, or alternatively, you can do it yourself. For example, if you run some icing transverse field icing Hamiltonian like this, right? And if you say, if you run some 
more complicated case that you have a lot of XX gate, right? Compare with this ZZ gate. Now you can apply a layer of, of what? A laser, a layer of RY of Y gate, Y pi half gate, I think. Y pi half gate. Um, that will convert your axis and which essentially enable you to perform ZZ, right? In the end, uh, if you even you do this, you may still end up realizing like because of the compilation, you still are essentially doing the same thing, but that's not always the case. Um, again, it's kind of tricky to give a general like statement on which one is better, whether they're the same. So, you know, according like based on your own specific need, you may need to play with it and see if there's a way to do it natively. I mean, our native in our native two qubit gates is always in the form of xx pi over two, which we call Momo Sorensen gate. Is that clear? I mean, it's kind of yeah. Uh, uh, that, that does help a bit. I think I need to read some more literature on on the the basis redefinition and find find some points where where people use it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think that's the end of our questions uh, and we're right at time, so that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Daiwei. Really enjoyed the talk. Uh, judging by the level of questions, uh, the audience did as well, so it's always great to see. And a uh, reminder to everybody, uh, if you haven't yet, uh, make sure you take a shot at your first job, and I'll repost this into the chat. And Submit your first job uh, for a chance to win in the raffle. Um, only need to enter once. And uh, there's a link there for some additional help if you, you want some step by step instructions. So uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Daiwei. Really appreciate it. And uh, good luck to those that are carrying forward to the uh, in person hackathon on Friday. Thanks, Matt.